Alright, so we are on the way, stable, on our route. Done my cruise check, and I have my sunshade to protect my neck, but I can still see traffic if I need to look. Okay. So you want to try to do one of your diamonds for one of your physics fights or something? Sure, yeah, so we want to do that. Alpha Mike, really, the pros, whenever you don't get stepped on, try to see if you can do it. Hello, pilot nerds. This is a flight with my friend Katie. We're on our way to AirVenture. She's a theoretical astrophysicist, also an instrument-rated pilot, so she's working the radios. And I thought it would be fun to try to talk about some super complicated concepts during some downtime en route. The Schrodinger's cat thing is really funny because it was basically set up as a way to show that quantum mechanics doesn't make sense, uh, or a specific, a specific piece of it doesn't make sense. So it was it was a correspondence between Schrodinger, Erwin Schrodinger, and Einstein. They were talking about superpositions. This idea that like something can be in two different states at once. Every particle doesn't really have a defined location. Charlie Fox, Charlie Golf Alpha, contact uh, approach one one nine point two. Okay, over to approach 119.2, Charlie Fox, Charlie Golf Alpha. So there will be some unavoidable interruptions when we have to deal with ATC, but for the most part, I'll trim them out. If you just take an electron and, like, fling it at a wall, right, um, it'll hit the wall at some point, but in the meantime, it is, it, it doesn't have a defined position or momentum. It's got this, like, wave function. Yeah, so a wave function is something that uh, contains information about how a particle, what, what its state is when it's not interacting with anything else. Like, if you want to predict what the, like, what, what's going to happen to the particle when it hits the wall after you fling it at it, you, you can't just say that it has some velocity and some, uh, you know, position. That wave function can include, like, it could be in a bunch of different places, or it could include things like it could have uh, spin up or spin down. It could include things like this, you know, some, a particle has decayed or it hasn't. Like, there's a whole range of things that, that could be included in that wave function. That wave function can include superpositions where you have, like, you know, two possible states, and you kind of just wrap that all up in the wave function. So it's just this packet of information that you assign to a particle to account for all the things that could be happening to it or the, all the things it could be doing. Anyway, so there was this thought experiment that I guess Schrodinger came up with, this idea that like, okay, so what if you have an atom that might decay or might not decay within a certain amount of time? Then you have to write down that that atom is in a superposition of those two states until you look at it, right? You put it in a sealed box, you don't know until you observe it if it's decayed or not, and so the wave function of that atom means that it has to, it has to be in the superposition. And that that's kind of sensible, but then it gets weirder because you can say, well, what if you put inside that box with the atom, you put like a Geiger counter that can detect whether it's been, whether it's decayed or not. And then you put, uh, connected to that Geiger counter, you put like this like vial of poison. So if the Geiger counter goes off, it breaks this vial of poison, puts a bunch of poison in the box. And then you put a cat in the box. So because that atom is in a superposition, then that means the Geiger counter has to be in a superposition, and so does the vial of poison, and so does the cat. And so the, the whole idea behind the Schrodinger's cat experiment is if the, if the superposition applies to the atom, and, and it only, it doesn't get solved until you open the box, then it applies to everything in the box, and so that cat is in a superposition of both alive and dead. And so like the reason this was a, a kind of mocking of the quantum, the whole quantum idea is that like that's clearly nonsensical, right? You can't have a, a cat both alive and dead at the same time. Right? That was the kind of that was the argument that, that these superpositions, like they can't really be applied to everything that you're not observing. And so Einstein was like, yeah, that's a great argument. You know, it totally shows that this, this doesn't make sense. But it's kind of unclear how, like, how you interpret um, what's happening in quantum mechanics. It's it's kind of unclear if it really is nonsense or not. Because you could say, well, you know, the superposition is broken as soon as the Geiger counter goes off, right? Like, that's a measurement. We're not the ones observing, but, like, something is measuring. But you could also say, well, it, there's different interpretations of quantum mechanics where whenever a measurement is made or whenever, like, a quantum state splits, basically, two, two whole universes kind of branch off of, the, of our universe. So one interpretation is that every time a quantum event happens, every time something splits off, you have this superposition. So what actually happens is that like a whole other universe branches off of our universe and so when you make the measurement what you're actually doing is figuring out which universe
universe you're in. Are you in the universe where the cat died, or are you in the universe where the cat's alive? You're not determining what happened, what you're doing is determining where you are in this like multiverse. That's the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, this idea that, that new universes branch off every time you do measurement. So but, like, the, the Marvel movies? Well, I mean... My feeling about the Marvel movies, so this idea that there's multiple universes where you could be some bad guy or whatever, yeah. I just feel like you wouldn't even exist because your parents didn't be like like the, the universe. Yeah. You would be speaking English. Maybe you're not even a human. Like like if, yeah. if a universe branches off every single time any one of these tiny events happens, there's infinite numbers, and therefore. Well, there's infinite numbers, and they branch off at infinite different places, right? So there's there's the one where where something you know happened at your birth that's different, but there's the one that so where something happened 30 seconds ago that's different. And so you can have, you can end up with like you know just an infinite string of universes uh, arbitrarily close or far from your own universe. The Marvel movies they're moving between universes, and that's something that we don't think is a thing that can happen. Like once once the branch off happens, once you're on a new track, you're on that track. You can't jump to a different one. When those universes split off, that's that's the end of all contact between those two scenarios. How does a quantum computer function if it can't be in the same universe at the same time? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So with a quantum computer, you're using the fact that these entangle, that these, uh, all your little bits are, are in superpositions to kind of do, it's, it's sort of like you're doing a bunch of different calculations at the same time. So entanglement is where you, you kind of link two things and you say, if this, if this one is in this state, then that one has to be in this state. They're kind of like, entanglement is weird too, right? You can, you can set up this thing where you, you can set up, you can take two atoms and you can set them up so that one of them is always going to have spin up and the other one's always going to have spin down and then you can separate them. And until you measure them, you don't know which one has which spin, but you know that they have the opposite spin. This is the thing that's been tested in real and it's like super wild. Entanglement has no distance limit. If you entangle two particles and take them, you know, as far apart as you want, you, you can still do the measurement and see the, the entanglement. You can test whether or not the entanglement is really happening by uh, using photons with different polarizations and you entangle the polarizations in a certain way and you do a bunch of measurements with photons going through these like wave splitters and stuff. And there's a certain outcome of how cor correlated... Charlie, Foxtrot, Charlie, Golf, Alpha, contact, South Bend Approach, 118.55. South Bend Approach 118.55, uh, Charlie Foxtrot, Charlie Golf Alpha. South Bend Approach, Charlie Foxtrot, Charlie Golf Alpha, 8000. RV Charlie Foxtrot, Charlie Golf Alpha, South Bend Approach, South Bend Altimeter 29 or 9 or 7. I have a full route clearance for you, advise ready to copy. Here we go. Okay. New page? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> a new page. Alright, uh, that's Altimeter 2 9 7 and we are ready to copy Charlie Fox, Charlie Golf Alpha. Charlie Fox, Charlie Golf Alpha, clear to Romeo Alpha, Charlie Airport via direct map intersection. Mike, Alpha, Papa, Papa, Sierra, direct Kelsey, Kilo, Echo, Lima, Sierra, India, direct. to Romeo Alpha Charlie via direct maps, uh, Mike Alpha Papa Papa Sierra, then Kelsey Kilo Echo Lima Sierra India, direct, uh, Fox, Charlie Fox Charlie, Charlie Golf Alpha. Charlie Fox Charlie Golf Alpha, read back correct, and when I go proceed direct maps and advise please. Okay, we'll, we'll proceed direct uh, maps, uh, we'll advise uh, Charlie Fox Charlie, Charlie Golf Alpha. Oh, insert before. 7473, contact Chicago Center, 133.2, 3320, good day. Yeah. Activate. Okay. And I'll check that on flight plan. Yes, let us okay. know we're doing it. Okay. So, front approach, uh, Charlie Foxtrot, Charlie Golf Alpha is going direct to maps. RV Foster Charlie Golf Alpha, roger. Third after, now it's going to be Kelsey. Yeah. Alright, so now I'm going to look at it to make sure it actually looks the way we think it makes sense. There's maps. LC. LC. Oh, he's yeah, sending yeah. us way out. Uh, approach. 325, uniform. It still might work out that when we get here, Chicago might give us something better. Yeah. But holy crap, they're sending us a long way. Alright, that's fine. And like I said, it's pretty possible once we're talking to Chicago, yeah. it might give us something better. Yeah. Okay, so what the hell were we talking about? The, uh, <laughs> we were talking 
give a, a tangle bank. How yeah. do you test it? Yeah, so the way you test it is you, you do this with polarization of photons and you're sending photons through mirrors and stuff, but you can you can work out that if the if the photons are really entangled, then when you measure the polarization over here of, you know, a whole bunch of photons, you should have a certain number of them with the same polarization as the ones over there. If there's some statistical correlation you can measure. It's not determined and then you do the measurement is determined and it's just this really bizarre way that the universe is set up. It's still it's still not clear how that happens. Like there are a couple of things here that are really unclear. So how entanglement happens is kind of unclear. How the wave function collapses is unclear. Like when you have a particle just traveling through space, has this wave function, has these indeterminate properties, and then at some point you measure it and it has properties. So like you don't there's we don't know why it goes from Charlie Fox Charlie, Charlie Golf Alpha Contact Approach one three two point zero five. Overdue approach 132.05, uh, Charlie Foxtrot, Charlie Golf Alpha. Approach Charlie Foxtrot, Charlie Golf Alpha, uh, 8,000 feet. Charlie Golf, Charlie Golf Alpha, South Center Approach, Roger. Charlie Foxtrot, sir. If he gets us wrong on the next call, we can correct him? Yeah. He should see us on the handoff, yeah. so... So, yeah, oh, that so, is a brain melter, man. Yeah, so like, so like that that many worlds thing comes from this question of like, how do you go from having being a wave function to being a, at a determined point? Like, because there's no mechanism for that wave function to choose an outcome, right? Like, if you if you throw that electron at the wall, there's a range of places it'll show up, and it'll show up over many many trials at that whole range. Uh, but each time it only picks one spot. Like, how does it pick that spot? We don't know how it chooses that spot, why it c corresponds with that probability distribution. It's it's totally, and that's that's why you get things like many worlds, just to try to explain that. But It's amazing to me when the theoretical stuff applies to the practical. You have to use the theoretical to get yourself to a place that you can do practical experiments. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's like the whole point of theoretical physics is to create a mathematical model of the universe. So what we do is we have a bunch of observations, a bunch of data, that gives us some set of numbers, right? And so we know if we do this thing, we get this number. If we do this thing, we get this number. And so we're trying to build like a, a cartoon picture of the universe, a mathematical model of the universe, where in our little model, if we say we're going to put in this thing, we're going to get this thing out. And so it's kind of like creating like some kind of machine that simulates the universe through our mathematics, right? It's not clear the extent to which that corresponds to what the universe is actually doing, right? All we can say is like, we put in this number, we get this number out. So if we say, when we put in this number, we get this number out sometimes, we get this number out sometimes, we get this number out sometimes, that gives us like a probability distribution. We have to create some kind of mathematical model where that will happen in our model. Yeah, like whether or not a wave function is real is kind of not, not something we can say. What we can say is the universe behaves as though it matches this mathematical model we've built. And that's what, that's all of what we ever do in physics, is we say, we have a mathematical model, it explains our data. When we get better data or different data, we, we might revise that model okay, because... 449, send me 10 yeah, that's great. That that's a layman thing that people don't understand. It's like yeah. they, they don't understand that science and math can evolve. Yeah. It's not like hard, but yeah. we're doing our best. At any point, all we can say is that our data fits with this model, and that this model is better than this other model, and we're just constantly doing that. Yeah, so that makes a good point because you can create a model that's ridiculous that just happens to work, right. and then people can be like, "See, that must be true." The sun, whatever, like yeah. silly things that primitive people have believed, and it, it it works based on the data they have. So this idea that some people say science is true, whether or not you believe it, it's like <laughs> that's an arguable statement. Right. But it's I like, mean, like, well, yeah, what even is true, right? And like, science is is constantly changing, and what we think something is changes based on kind of how we're measuring it and what what our model is at that point. So like an atom, we first learned in school that an atom is like a little ball, it's like the smallest piece of matter, right? And then you you then go from there and you learn actually no, it's got it's a bunch of little tiny balls in the middle and then little other balls going around the outside, right? And then later on you learn actually, you know, those those little balls going around on the outside, they're not really going in circles, they're in kind of these weird blobby probability bubbles that, that comes out of chemistry. It's not that you were being lied to initially. So like depending on what you're doing with the atom, it might act like a little ball, or it might act like something with with electrons going around it, or it might act like something with individual neutrons, like fruit neutrons and protons, depending on what you're doing to it. Like it, it would be silly to talk about protons and neutrons inside the the atomic nucleus 
if all you're doing is, is something where the atom really acts like it's a solid ball. Like if we, if we wanted to, to calculate like how, far, how, how quickly a ball will, will roll down a hill, you could do full general relativity and bring out Einstein's equations and, and it'll give you the right answer, but you'll, you'll mess something up along the way, right? Like it's just way too complicated. It's, a, it's, it's not the appropriate model. Newton's laws are the appropriate model for a ball rolling down a hill. And same way with atoms, like sometimes the appropriate model is it's a little, it's a solid little ball. Sometimes the appropriate model requires understanding nuclear physics. And so it's it's kind of like these models that we build, it's not that the, the ball model is wrong. The ball model is, is appropriate in its in its context. And sometimes, you know, depending on how you look at it, sometimes it's out of visible and sometimes it's not. The one thing I've heard from some people is this, yeah. this idea that there's only one electron can't, yeah, can't, yeah. can't be proven wrong. Yeah. Which is like, that is a mind melter. I mean, it has to be traveling backward in time sometimes. So, like, it depends on how you think about that. It has to be traveling backwards in time to get everywhere? Yeah, basically, yeah. Like, sometimes it's traveling back in time, so I don't know. I mean, I haven't, I don't, I, could, I shouldn't say anything about that model because I haven't really looked into it, but... But the point is it exists, that is a thing. That is, a, it's a thing that Charlie people talk about. about. Charlie Golf, Alpha Contact, Chicago Center on 132.50. Over to Chicago Center, 132.50, Charlie Foxtrot, Charlie Golf, Alpha. Okay, this is where hopefully we can renegotiate or they might okay. even offer. Okay, I'll check in. Yep. So we checked in and then started working on a diversion plan to get fuel at an airport that was closer to our route of travel as opposed to our original plan, which would have put us down near the lake, which no longer made sense because we were going so far around Chicago's airspace. What about Keft? K-E-F-T, Monroe Municipal. It's got good gas prices. Uh, and the runway is long and wide and it's in the right direction for the winds today. I'm just going to look at it and we would go VFR from there. Yeah. It's a half-hour flight. I don't know. What do you think? I don't see any downside to change that. that that's the best fuel price I see. Yeah, and it gets us closer to going straight to Ripon, too. Uh, it won't be Ripon, but it'll be one of those waypoints along yeah, the way. Yeah, on the left, though. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's good. It's going to take us up there to Puckaway Lake and all that stuff, so... When it's not busy, we can ask for that and just say we'd like to divert to... Number 1503, yeah. six contact, first up, first on 121.05. Wait till we get closer to Kelsey, though. Yeah, they're not going to give us a turn over here, yeah. but if they know we want to head there... Chicago Center, uh, Charlie Foxtrot, Charlie Golf Alpha. I wonder if maybe we could divert to uh, Kilo Echo Foxtrot Tango. Say that one more time. What, what the airport do you want to divert to, and what's the reason for the diversion? Monroe Municipal. It's uh, Echo Foxtrot Tango, and the reason is uh, for closer to the ultimate destination. You said it's closer to your destination. We're going to go on to Oshkosh after this, so um, it'd be easier to go from there. Okay, I'll uh, have it for you here shortly. Stand by. Thank you. Yeah, I guess it makes sense to give them more information sooner, so that if they need to. Yeah, it doesn't hurt if they're not yeah. busy. Just tell them what you. Like one, two, seven, because two, we told her right here. Up? I want to do yeah. that. It's like um. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's the fact uh, that yeah. she's sequencing us with someone else on the same route. Blah blah yeah. blah. Yeah. This might make her life easier. Charlie Foxtrot, Charlie Golf Alpha. You're now cleared to the Echo Foxtrot Tango Airport. Be direct to Kelsey Still, then direct to Griff. Direct. Maintain eight thousand. Number eight, three, Charlie, Mike, are you up at seven? Uh, it's so another yeah, eight, three, Charlie, Mike, with you. Yeah. Let's save some time. Number eight, three, Charlie, yeah. Mike, Chicago, Center, Kegel, Center, 299 or eight. Uh, the IFR isn't always the most convenient. Yeah. Because if we were VFR, we could have, uh, we could have just ducked down and gone along the water. Yeah. We still theoretically could do that. We could cancel IFR and just be like, goodbye. Um, but I'd rather not. I'm good with this plan. Sorry. Getting some thoughts out. I could get some of those Ritz crackers if you've got any of those in there. Oh, yeah. oh, here, why don't you finish off this bag? It's already open. Or if you want to. Oh, that's good. Get the uh, cashews. So I hope you enjoyed that one, and sorry it's been a while since I published here. It's been a little bit busy over on Flight Chops, but I'm going to pull some scenes out of this one for the upcoming episode on Flight Chops. Okay, but let's cut cameras because it'll be a while now. And until the next one, stay nerdy. <laughs>